strange affair of the Florentine chest by Percy James Brebner. Only the other day, in a turning off Finsbury pavement, there was demolished one of those anachronisms which used to be met with more frequently in London, an old house sandwiched in between immense blocks of buildings, a relic of the past holding its own against the commercial necessities and rush of modern civilization. It was connected with a very strange case Quarles and I had to deal with not long after the Seligman affair. The house looked absurdly small in the midst of its surroundings, but had once been a desirable residence, probably standing in its own gardens. Now it was almost flush with the street, dingy to look at, yet substantial. The door, set back in a porch, had two windows on either side of it, and there were four windows in the story above it. A brass plate on the door had engraved upon it, Mr. Portman, and it would appear that the bare fact of such a gentleman's existence was considered sufficient information to give to the world, since there was nothing to show what was his calling in life, nor what hours he was prepared to transact business. As a matter of fact, he not only did his business in the old house, but lived there. The room on the right side of the hall was the living room. On the left was a small apartment, with windows of frosted glass, which was occupied during certain hours of the day by his only clerk, a cadaverous and unintellectual-looking youth, whose chief work in life seemed to be the cutting of his initials into various parts of the cheap furniture which the room contained. Behind this office, but not connected with it, was Mr. Portman's business room, to which no one penetrated unless conducted thither by the cadaverous youth. Behind the living room, down a passage, was the kitchen, where Mrs. Eccles, the housekeeper, passed her days. A girl occasionally came in to help her, otherwise she was solely responsible for her master's comfort. One November afternoon, Mr. Portman returned to his house shortly after four o'clock. He stood in the doorway of the small room for a few moments, giving instructions to his clerk, and then went to his own room, closing the door after him. A little later, Mrs. Eccles took him some tea on a tray, which he did every afternoon when he was at home. He talked to her for some minutes about a friend who was coming to dinner with him on the following evening, giving her such particular orders that he evidently wished to entertain this friend particularly well. Soon after five, Mrs. Eccles returned to fetch the tray. The door was locked then, and Mr. Portman called out to her that he was busy, but was going out shortly, when she could have the tray. It was nearly six when she went to the room again. Mr. Portman had gone out, but evidently did not expect to be long, as he had left the gas burning only turning it low. She had not heard him go, but the clerk said Mr. Portman had come out of his room at a quarter to six, had paused in the passage outside to say, I shall not be long, but you needn't wait, good night, and had then gone out, closing the front door quietly behind him. He did not return that night. For five days Mrs. Eccles waited, and then, growing alarmed, gave information to the police. These were the bare facts of the case when it came into my hands, but I was told that my investigations might possibly throw some light on two or three cases which had puzzled the authorities in recent years. Mr. Portman was a money lender, and had so long called himself Portman for business purposes that possibly he had almost forgotten his real name himself. Since for years he had transacted his business unmolested, it was probable that the evil reports which had been circulated concerning him from time to time were grossly exaggerated, but the fact remained that the police authorities had taken considerable trouble to collect items concerning Portman's career, and had kept an eye upon him. Complaints about him had reached them, but those who borrow money are easily critical of those who lend, and there had never been sufficient warrant for taking any action. If, as happened at intervals, Portman had to appear in the witness box, he came through the ordeal fairly well. He might show that he was bent on getting his pound of flesh, but he was always careful to have the law on his side. He was legally honest. That was his attitude. He could not afford to be generous when a large percentage of his clients would certainly cheat him if they had the chance. Portman's business room at the back of the house was large, but dark and depressing, its two windows, which were heavily barred, looking onto the blank wall of a warehouse. A large desk and a safe gave it a business aspect, but the room was crowded with costly furniture, which fancy might suppose had once belonged to some unfortunate debtor who had been unable to satisfy Mr. Portman's demands. Some good pictures hung upon the walls, and in a recess opposite the door stood an old chest, heavily clamped with iron. 
The key, which might have hung at the waist of a medieval jailer, so huge was it, was in the lock, which was evidently out of order. When I turned the key, the lid would not open. Looking through the drawers in the desk, I found several letters which showed that Mr. Portman's business was often with well-known people, men one would not expect to find associated with him in any way, and the sums involved were often so large that only a rich man could deal with them. Mrs. Eccles answered my questions without any hesitation. Whatever the world might think of Mr. Portman, she appeared to have had a genuine affection for him. She had noticed no change in him recently. He had appeared to her to be in his usual health and spirits. When you went for the tray and found the door locked, did you think he had anyone with him? I asked. I didn't hear anyone, but I can't say I listened. It was not the first time I had found the door locked and had been told to go back presently for the tray. A friend was to dine with him on the following night. Did the friend come? No. What was his name? Mr. Portman did not mention it. Did you prepare the dinner? No. Why not? I asked. You did not communicate with the police until five days later, so you must have been expecting your master to return. It's difficult to say exactly what I expected, Mrs. Eccles answered, but I never thought about preparing the dinner. When he didn't return, I began to think something was wrong, because I've never known him to be away, even for a night, without letting me know. Why didn't you give the information sooner? Sooner? Why, I keep on asking myself whether I've done right in getting it at all. The master might walk in at any moment, and I don't know what he'd say if he did. The clerk seemed to think that Mr. Portman had been worried recently. He had had several pieces of business, which the youth said had not progressed too smoothly. He knew practically nothing about these various items of business, but he gave me the names of half a dozen people who had called upon Mr. Portman during the past week or two. He was close, you know, the youth went on. Didn't give much away about his doings. Then why do you think he has been worried recently, I asked. He's been snappy with me, was the answer. But by the way he spoke the other night when he went out, I thought everything must have come right. A further investigation of Mr. Portman's room resulted in a curious find. Under a bookcase, which was raised a few inches from the floor, I discovered a key, the key of the safe. How it had come there, whether it was a duplicate or the one Mr. Portman carried, it was impossible to decide. Apparently the safe had not been opened, for a drawer therein contained a large sum in gold and notes and there was not the slightest indication that any of the papers had been touched. It was quite evident, however, that a number of people would profit by Portman's death, especially if he should die suddenly and leave no one to carry on his business, and this was precisely what had happened. Not a relative or friend had come forward to lay claim to anything, and many of his debtors were likely to go free. Among these was Lord Stanford, one of the names the clerk had given me as recent visitors, and I went to see him only to find that he had left England the day after Portman's disappearance. He had gone to Africa, and that was all I could discover. Another man who had called upon Portman recently, and whom I went to see, was a Mr. Isaacson. From him I obtained an interesting piece of information. He had seen Portman in Finsbury Pavement on the evening of his disappearance. He must have met him some ten minutes after he had left his house. I stopped to speak to him, but he was in a hurry and did not stop, said Isaacson. I suppose you were not due to dine with him on the following evening, I said. Dine with him? No, I have never had that honor. I do not think you quite appreciate Mr. Portman's position. I lend money in a small way. There are many like me, and if occasion happens, business comes to us which is too large for us to deal with, we go to Mr. Portman. The business is carried through in our names, but Mr. Portman is the real creditor. In his own way, Mr. Portman was a man of importance and a man of mystery. There was nothing to suggest he was dead, and it's quite possible that some crooked business had kept him from home unexpectedly. I chanced to go and see Christopher Quarles one evening when I got to this point in my investigations, and he at once began to ask questions about the Finsbury affair. I had not intended to enlist his help. I was quite satisfied with the progress I had made, but he was so keen about the mystery that I told the whole story to him and Zena. "'You seem very interested,' I said when I had finished. "'I am. Mr. Portman has been talked about before now, and I remember I once had a theory about him.' Does the present affair help to confirm that theory? I asked. He shrugged his shoulders. It might be interesting to know why Lord Stafford has gone abroad, he said. That is exactly the line I am following, I returned. 
"'I should like to know something about the man who was coming to dinner and did not come,' said Zena. "'It is curious that he should have heard so quickly of Mr. Portman's death, and more curious still that he should make no inquiries.' "'Lord Stamford may be able to tell us something about him,' I said. "'Zena makes a point, Wigan,' said Quarles. "'It is rather a complicated puzzle. "'Of course, Portman may not be dead, "'but if he is alive, why should he run the risk of a police search among his papers? "'He would know that such an investigation would be likely to do him harm. "'He would hardly run such a risk. "'Since Mr. Isaacson saw him in Finsbury Pavement, he has vanished completely.' He left the gas burning in his room, therefore he did not expect to be out long. He was hurrying, according to Mr. Isaacson, presumably to keep an appointment. Now, if he is dead, it looks like a premeditated thing, because there is no body. It is easy enough to murder. It is the most difficult thing in the world to hide the victim successfully. If a sudden crime is committed and the murderer has his wits about him, the body will probably be found under circumstances likely to throw suspicion on anyone but the right man. But a premeditated crime usually means the disappearance of the body if in any way it can be managed. So we get a kind of theory which may carry us a long way, and the further we go, we shall be the more convinced. I fancy that many other theories are just as likely to be right. Portman may not be dead, I said. For the reasons I have given, I think we may presume that he is, Quiles answered. The difficulty of the case arises from the fact that so many people stand to profit by his death. Stanford, for instance, said I. And Isaacson, perhaps, he returned, and a score of others. As far as Stanford is concerned, he is a young man with expectations, but with little money at present. He is probably in the hands of other money lenders besides Portman. He is a fool, no doubt, but one would not expect him to be a murderer. Given certain conditions, you cannot tell what a man will do. True, Wigan, but I do not find the required conditions. Don't let me influence you. Something may be learned from Stanford, but that would not be my line of attack. What would yours be? I should like to talk to Mrs. Eccles and the clerk. When Quarles solved the case, his explanation was usually so clear that one could only marvel that the salient points had not been apparent to everybody from the first. When he was considering the difficulties, it seemed impossible that the mystery could ever be solved. As I listened to him, I felt that his help was necessary in this affair. Why not come with me to Finsbury? I said. I will tomorrow, he answered. By the way, Wigan, wasn't it foggy on the night of Portman's disappearance? It was, dear, said Zena. Don't you remember? I went to see some people at Highgate that day and was late for dinner. Quarles nodded and changed the conversation. He had done with the affair until tomorrow. When I met him next morning, wrapped in a heavy cloak, for it was cold, I couldn't help thinking that he looked the very last man in the world to solve an intricate mystery. He was the kind of old gentleman who would annoy everybody by asking foolish questions and telling stories which had grown hoary with age. I'm a simple old fool, Wigan, that's my character, he said, guessing my thoughts. And if you can look annoyed with me and show irritability, so much the better. Where does Isaacson live? I should like to see him first. I found it quite easy to be irritable. When we called on Isaacson, Quarles asked him the most ridiculous questions, which certainly had nothing whatever to do with Portman but in a vague way concerned a theory and honesty of money-lending. "'Was Mr. Portman a Jew?' he asked suddenly. "'Yes.' "'I seem to remember seeing him without glasses,' said Quarles. "'I thought Jews always wore glasses.' "'We are usually short-sighted,' said Isaacson, touching his spectacles. "'I am myself. Mr. Portman worked in glasses always, but if you met him on the street you would probably see him without them.' "'Ah, you are remembering that he did not wear them the night you met him in Finsbury Pavement,' said Quarles. "'That is probably why he did not see you.' "'He happened to be wearing them that night,' Isaacson returned. "'I believe he did see me, but was in too much of a hurry to stop.' "'Rude, very rude,' remarked Quarles. "'Small men have to put up with many things from big ones,' said Isaacson humbly. The professor treated him to a short dissertation on the equality of man, and then we left. "'Honest, I think, so far as he goes,' said Quarles, but he is desperately afraid of being drawn too deeply into this affair. He couldn't afford to be questioned too closely about his business, Wigan. It had been thought advisable to keep the clerk at his post for the present, and he was quite ignorant of the fact that he was watched both during his business and leisure hours. His own importance rather impressed him at this time.' 
and Quarles soon succeeded in making him talkative, but as far as I could see, very little of what he said was worth particular note. "'I think Mr. Portman would have been wise if he had confided more in you,' said Quarles, after talking to him for some time. "'I think so, too,' the youth answered. "'He never did, I suppose?' "'No, no, I can't say he ever did.' "'When he came in that afternoon, he stood in the doorway there and talked to you?' He was telling me about some papers he would want in the morning. Very snappy he was, I can tell you. The weather, possibly, it was foggy and unpleasant. He was usually unpleasant, no matter what the weather was. He paid me fairly well, or I shouldn't have stayed with him, as I have done. Yet, when we went out later that evening, he stopped in the doorway to say good night. He did, and you might have knocked me down with a feather, said the youth. I don't remember his ever doing such a thing before. I'd put some letters which had come during the afternoon on his table and the news in them must have been good. He'd had some worrying business on hand, I know. That would certainly account for his cordiality, said Quarles. Really, I sympathize with you. Practically, I suppose you have little to do but answer the door when the bell rings. If the office bell rings, I pull this catch, the youth said, and the client walks in. The front door has a spring on it and closes itself. Sometimes a fool will ring the office bell when it's Mrs. Eccles he wants, and that's annoying. Very laughed the professor. Did any clients call that day? No. A chap wanting to sell some patent office files came and wasted my time for a quarter of an hour. Swore that the governor had seen him two or three months ago and told him to call. A rotten patent it was, too. He showed them to you? Had a bag full of them. Wanted me to buy the beastly things. I had to be rude to get rid of him. Did you go to the door with him? Not much, the youth answered. I just pulled his catch and told him he would find the door open, and the sooner he got out of it, the better. He would have liked to borrow a bob or two, I fancy, but I wasn't parting. Did you tell Mr. Portman he had called? I never worried him with callers of that sort. Then Quarles became impressive. I suppose you have no idea where Mr. Portman is? To your knowledge, nothing has happened which would account for his absence? Nothing. If you want my opinion... I should say he's dead, had an accident, most likely, and no papers on him to say who he was. One more question, said Quarles, in strict confidence, mind. Is Mrs. Eccles honest? As daylight, was the prompt reply. Would she have put the police on this business if she hadn't been? I never thought of that, said Quarles humbly. Your brain is young and mine is old. Makes a difference, no doubt, said the youth. And my memory is like a sieve, the professor went on. I've already forgotten whether this file seller was a clean-shaven chap or wore a beard. Don't worry about that, said the youth, because I didn't describe him. He was an old chap with a gray beard, and had lost most of his teeth, I should think, by the way he talked. Poor fellow, poor fellow. I expect I should have been fool enough to give him a bob. I expect you would, laughed the youth in his superior wisdom. With Mrs. Eccles, Quarles' method was still foolish. For some time he did not mention Mr. Portman, and so silly was he that I should not have been surprised had the woman been less respectful in her manner. But he set her talking as he had set the clerk talking, and she was presently explaining that the guest her master was expecting to dine with him must have been of considerable importance because the preparations were elaborate. "'He's never given such a dinner before,' said Mrs. Eccles, "'and I suggested that with such preparation... He might have asked other guests. And the wine? asked Quarles. He said he would look after that himself. Very natural, answered the professor. You've been with Mr. Porton many years, haven't you? Fourteen or more. So long. I wonder if you remember a young friend of mine who used to come here, I think. Ten or eleven years ago, it must be. He squinted and had red hair. I do remember him said Mrs. Eccles. He came here to dine once, I recollect. I believe Mr. Portman said he was going abroad. I know he dined here, and I do not think I saw him again. Quarles nodded. I believe he did leave the country, some said in disgrace. I wonder who it was that was going to dine with Mr. Portman that night. The master didn't say. All he said was an old friend. A young man might be called an old friend said Quarles. Oh, he couldn't be young, said Mrs. Eccles, because the master said he had known him when he was a young man. That is interesting, 
said quarles shall we go and look at mr portman's room wigan when we closed the door quarles stood in the center of the room and looked slowly round it was that screen standing there when you first entered the room wigan yes where did you find the safe key under that bookshelf he went to the safe and walked slowly from it to the door flicking his hand as he went then he looked out of the windows no exit or entrance that way he said there is only the door is that the chest that won't open he turned the key and tried the lid he could not lift it he locked the chest then unlocked it again and hammered upon the lid with his fist the bolts sound as if they worked properly he said i think it's only that the lid has caught somehow we tackled it together and after several efforts we succeeded in raising the lid the chest was empty quarles examined it very closely without and within we could not move it it was too heavy but the professor produced a magnifying glass and studied the marks on the wood he measured the length and depth of the chest and shut it and opened it several times "'Opens quite easily now, Wigan,' he remarked. "'Very carefully he had put two newspapers into it, "'and some odd bits of paper, which he took from his pocket. "'You see how I have placed them, Wigan, "'which way up the newspapers are "'and the scraps of writing on this piece of paper? "'We'll set a trap.' "'And he closed the chest and locked it. "'This is an old house, and there may be a way into this room "'which we know nothing about. We shall see.' We left the room, but Quarles told me not to lock the door. He beckoned me to follow him to the kitchen. Mrs. Eccles, how long has your master had that oaken chest in his room? He asked the housekeeper. It's been there all my time, sir. Well, I shouldn't be surprised if it is connected with your master's disappearance. Mrs. Eccles' mouth slowly opened in astonishment. We shall be back in two hours, and then, then we shall know. We left her and went to the office. The youth was cutting an initial in the corner of the table. "'Busy, I see,' said Quarles. "'I fancy Mr. Portman's disappearance has something to do with that old chest in his room.' "'How can that be?' "'I don't know yet. We are going to make an important inquiry and shall be back in a couple of hours. We will be careful to ring the office bell, not the house one.' As we turned to the front door, Quarles caught my arm. He opened the door, letting it go so that it would close itself. For a few moments we remained motionless, then, creeping toward the office door, watched until the clerk's back was turned, and went quickly to Portman's room. "'It is very easy, Wigan,' whispered the professor. "'If for us, then also for others. You see why I did not want you to lock the door of this room? Now we are in, we will lock it on the inside, and that screen will hide us.' "'There is no question that Mr. Portman left the house,' I said. Oh, no, Isaacson was quite definite, but I am trying to fit facts to my theory. I said we should be back in two hours, so we have about two hours to wait. There was plenty of room behind the screen, but those two hours went slowly. I could not decide what theory the professor had got in his mind, but concluded that he was not so satisfied with the honesty of Mrs. Eccles and the cadaverous youth as I was. He had looked at his watch when we went behind the screen, and he allowed a full two hours to elapse before he would leave our hiding place. He walked straight to the chest and opened it. It was empty. All the papers had gone. Well, Wigan? I stared into the chest and did not answer. It looks like another way into this room, doesn't it? And then he started. We're out of it. I hadn't thought of that. Wait. He took an old envelope from his pocket, dropped it into the chest and locked it. He waited a moment, then opened the chest again. The envelope had gone. "'I confess, Wigan, that this is a surprise,' said Quarles. "'I must go home and think. I believe, yes, I believe we have the clue. You must search Portman's papers for some reference to a business acquaintance, probably a foreigner. Perhaps Portman knows Italy, Florence. It might very likely be Florence. I fancy this chest had its home there. If you can find any reference to a friend who is a Florentine and can lay hands on him, you might question him closely about his movements on the day of Portman's disappearance. The first thing is to get this chest moved, I said. Let that wait for forty-eight hours, said Quarles. We may have a more complete story by then. Give me until tomorrow night, then come and see me.
When I went to Chelsea the following night, I was taken at once to the empty room. Zena was there. Quarles was standing by his table, on which was a rough plan, evidently a production of his own, and quite unintelligible without an explanation. Of course, you have not discovered anything yet, Wigan? There has not been time, I answered. No, quite so, he said, motioning me to a seat. But we have a fairly clear story, I think. Zena said, you remember, that she would like to know something about the man who was coming to dine with Portman that night. It was an important point, particularly so, since the guest did not put in an appearance. You saw the importance of it, Wigan, because you asked Isaacson whether he was the expected guest. Now, Isaacson had seen Portman after he left his house that night, but had not spoken to him. This fact suggested a question in my mind. Was Isaacson telling the truth? There were two possibilities. Isaacson might have seen him, gone with him, and be responsible for his disappearance, or he might have been mistaken. The man he saw might not have been Portman. The second possibility was the one which appealed to me. The fact remained, however, that Isaacson knew him well, Therefore, the man he took to be Portman must have wished to be taken for Portman, I argued. This would account for his hurrying on without speaking, since a closer investigation might have betrayed him. I looked for some fact to support this theory. I found it in Isaacson's statement that Portman wore glasses in the street on this occasion, which was unusual, so unusual, mark you, that Isaacson noticed it. Now, if my theory were right, it seemed possible that after Mr. Portman entered his room that afternoon, he never left it. He was there when Mrs. Eccles took in the tea tray, there could be no doubt. But that it was Mr. Portman who answered through the locked door was another matter. Such a fantastic theory required strong support, the professor went on. The clerk helped me. When he came into the house that afternoon and gave his clerk instructions about certain papers, Mr. Portman was snappy, his usual self, in fact, and incidentally he proved that he had no intention of being away from the office on the following day. When he left the house, he was quite different, genially wishing the clerk good night. Wigan, a man slightly overplaying his part, would be likely to do that, especially as he wanted the clerk to be in a position to say that his master had gone out at a certain hour. He was bound to draw the clerk's attention to himself, so he did it with a cordial good night. Knowing that Mr. Portman wore glasses, he would also wear them, even in the street. But the clerk would have seen it was not Mr. Portman, I objected. That was a difficulty, said Quarles. It was a foggy afternoon, we know, and would be dark in the passage, but hardly dark enough to deceive the clerk. Another difficulty was how a stranger could get into the house without being seen. Both difficulties vanished when the clerk told us of the man who called selling patent files. He had a bag, Wigan, containing more than samples of files, I warrant. Means of disguise as well. We know how easy it is to let the front door slam and remain in the house. I think the file seller practiced the same trick we did even going to Portman's room and hiding behind the screen. You see, the office windows are frosted, so the clerk cannot see whether anyone leaving the office passes into the street or not. If there is something fantastic in this theory, let me pursue it to the end. If I am right, one thing is certain, this file seller knew Portman well. He must have come prepared to make himself up like him. He was able to answer Mrs. Eccles when she knocked at the door and deceive her. Granted that he knew Mr. Portman well, we may assume that he was in some way associated with him in business. Only one man left that room, therefore, as things stand, we may assume that these two men were enemies who had once been friends. Here, let me be imaginative for a moment. Mr. Portman was expecting a friend to dine with him on the following night, an important person, since the feast to be prepared was, according to Mrs. Eccles, somewhat elaborate. The sumptuousness of a feast may mean great friendship, but it may be used to hide intense enmity. You read such things in the history of the Medici of Florence, I believe, Wigan, that the feast was prepared for the same file seller, that the wine which Mr. Portman was looking after himself, remember, would have proved unwholesome for the guest, who, distrusting Portman, came a day earlier and removed his enemy. A little imaginative, I said. Imagination bridges the intervals between facts, Quarles answered. We get again to a fact, the iron-bound chest. It links the two men together. I have no doubt the file seller knew of its peculiar mechanism as well as Portman did. You could not open it, and since the key was in the lock, no mystery about it, you naturally did not think it of much importance. When together we succeeded in opening it, I found on the floor of it a tiny stain. I thought it was a blood stain, but I was not sure. At any rate, the measurements of the chest were such that a body might be pressed in it. Frankly, I admit I expected to see Portman's body when we raised the lid. For the sake of some documents, 
It is impossible to say what they were. I believe this file seller had murdered Portman, taken his key, opened the safe, taken the papers he wanted, thrust the body into the chest, and had then departed in the character of his victim, flinging the safe key under the bookcase as he went. As there was no body, I wonder whether Mrs. Eccles or the clerk or both were accomplices of the murderer, whether that chest might not conceal a secret entrance to the room. The idea did not fit my theory very well, but I laid a trap, and you know the result, Wigan. The action of shutting that chest opens the bottom of it, so that whatever is placed in it falls out as soon as the lid is closed and locked. I believe the body of Portman was in it, and I got caught somehow. That it was why you could not open it, why we could not open it until we had hammered about it, and by constant working upon the lid had released the body. I feel certain that chest had its home in Florence. That is why I suggested an Italian may be the criminal. He may have been long resident in England, of course. Certainly he is a man who speaks English perfectly, or the clerk would have described him as a foreigner. But the body, where is it? I asked. I've been to the British Museum today, said Quarles, taking up the rough sketch from his desk. This is a copy of an old map of the Finsbury district, and here I find was one of the old plague pits. I believe Portman's house stands on this plot. It was a very rough sketch, but as I compared the place the professor had indicated with the old landmarks under modern equivalents which he had marked, there could be little doubt that Quarles was right. I do not suppose that Portman's is the first body that has passed through that chest and slid down into some hole which was once a part of this pit, he went on. I asked Mrs. Eccles about a squinting youth. He was a young fool with expectations, just another as Lord Stanford. He was robbed right and left, and it is quite certain Portman, among others, made money out of him. He disappeared suddenly. It is possible Lord Stanford might have disappeared in a similar way had not his friends got him out of the country. Portman didn't have that chest fixed on the floor of his room for nothing. You may find a solution to more than one mystery, Wigan, when you move that chest. Portman's body and the remains of at least three other bodies were found in the deep hole under the old house in Finsbury. How the hole had come there, or how Portman had discovered it, it was impossible to guess, but there could be little doubt that he had only been treated as he had treated others. And some six months afterward, a man named Postini was knifed in Milan, and the inquiry into his murder brought to light the fact that he had been closely connected with Portman. They had worked together in London, in Paris, and in Rome. At the time of Portman's death, they had quarreled, and at that time Postini was in London. Among Portman's papers, I found nothing relating to Postini. No doubt the Italian had taken them, for Portman's letter asking him to dine and become true friends again, was found among the Italian's papers. There can be little doubt, I think, that Quarles was right. Portman intended to rid himself of the Italian after giving him a sumptuous feast, but Postini, wholly distrusting his former comrade, had come a day before his time and been the murderer instead of the victim. End of The Strange Affair of the Florentine Chest